Johannes Krause um, is uh, one of the leading archaeogeneticists and uh, paleogeneticists internationally of these days, without any doubt. He got his PhD uh, with Svante Pebo in Leipzig in 2006 or 2008, and then very quickly moved as a junior professor to the University of Tübingen and uh, I know very well that you were one of the, or you were the youngest professor in Germany at that time. Uh, and uh, then, not, not uh, long after that, he became one of the two founding directors of the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in uh, Jena, uh, which uh, is uh, something to get as a relatively young person becoming one of a Gründungsdirektor of a Max Planck Institute. And, uh, then um, he uh, uh, is now director of this Max Planck Institute for in Leipzig in evolutionary anthropology, but he moved his group, uh, his department from Jena um, to um, Leipzig. He will, uh, to Leipzig. He will talk about a super interesting question right now, but you all have heard about uh, Johannes Krause because you all have heard the news in March that Beethoven's genome was sequenced completely and it was found out that Beethoven had liver disease and Beethoven had a father who had some extramarital affairs and something like that. And so he can read out of a genome anything you want. And uh, <laughs> by the way, who gets hairs of Beethoven? to sequence, that is, you know, not everybody's, not everybody gets it. With that, uh, Johannes, it's a great honor, it's a pleasure to have you. He was here many years ago as a, at a Darwin talk and uh, fascinated um, uh, 1,000 school children of Schleswig-Holstein with a different talk and uh, he will fascinate you now with his new uh, insights into the plague and, uh, and other diseases. Johannes, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, and that's what you get if you don't come for the last two times to get a keynote lecture, so thank you. Um, and uh, I have to also say I haven't been here for 10 years now. It was actually 2012 I've been here for the last time, um, so before KLS even. And it's really impressive to see what you have built up, and I'm really glad to kind of see all the things uh, today, and then hopefully also as much as I can tomorrow morning. Um, and in fact, when I was here in 2012, um, I was invited for a, a finding symposium for a professorship, and uh, Thomas had actually approached me just a week before, I think, uh, whether I would have time to come for the symposium, and I really enjoyed that. And actually what came out of that symposium is that I got approached a week later from the Max Planck Society to start a new Max Planck Institute. So I have to thank actually Thomas a lot, because if he would have not invited me, I might have still been a professor at the University of Tübingen, and that actually opened up the possibility for that new Max Planck Institute. So thank you again for all your efforts in that direction as well. Um, and it's my great pleasure today to talk about some research that I in fact proposed in 2012 during that symposium. Um, and that's a research that I know called ancient pathogen genomics. Um, that's, what, that's actually what I was talking about then because we had the first couple of results uh, that I presented at that symposium 10 years ago. And today I want to kind of go a bit beyond, of course, what we have done then 10 years ago and kind of show you a bit the story that has unfolded over the last 10 years in that field of ancient pathogen genomics with a special um, then emphasis on the origin of plague or Yersinia pestis, the causative agent of plague. Um, but before, as, as a keynote lecture, I want to kind of just go a bit um, beyond plague itself and uh, talk a little bit about infectious diseases and the history of infectious diseases. Um, and uh, I think this is probably not new to many of you that study evolution and uh, microbiology, um, but uh, still I think it's always a good reminder to think a bit about wh where infectious diseases actually evolved, how did they evolve, and how did they become human adapted. And the story, at least, is proposed to have started um, quite recently in our human evolution, and that is in the last maybe 10,000 years or so, that most infectious diseases have an origin during that time that they have entered the human population due to reposis that we, of course, call zoonosis, so from some humans that lived in close proximity then from with a human populations, so or from some animals that you, for example, see here on that slide, uh, that uh, then humans started to domesticate during that time. Some pathogens were thought to have then um, entered the human population. There's a few diseases that are caused by those pathogens um, here on the slide. So measles, smallpox, flu, tuberculosis, plague, leprosy, and pertussis were all examples where people have proposed in the past that they entered the human 
population during that time. So what happened during that time, of course, humans settled down and humans developed settlements. This is a reconstruction here of such a settlement from 9,000 years ago from Chateau Huyuk, um, which already housed back in the day a few thousand people. And you can imagine that only at that point, when humans are sedentary and live in a large, dense population, pathogens see humans as a host that is somehow attractive. Because if you imagine that humans lived as a small band of hunter-gatherers for thousands of years, for even millions of years potentially, if pathogens were picked up from the environment and entered the human population, they might have infected the entire group of 15 individuals of those hunter-gatherers. But it was very unlikely that those pathogens were then passed on from one group of hunter-gatherers to another group of hunter-gatherers. But of course, if you imagine you have a situation like that, where you have a family here that might get a a disease from those goats over here, the pathogen can easily spread from one house to another house, affect the entire or half of the village, and then gets maybe transported by trade routes to the next village. So only at that point, pathogens then really have some sort of large advantage to become human adapted. And that is at least kind of the theory. We'll then later on also see some examples where we could really um, then uh, support this idea that those pathogens evolved um, quite recently to become uh, human adapted or as human pathogens, but there's in fact also quite a number of um, examples where this was not the case and they were actually around much longer in human populations. Um, it is then thought that those pathogens then, of course, during then human history caused bigger and bigger epidemic outbreaks because the human population was increasing. Um, as today we have uh, even billions of people and there are then some of those larger outbreaks that are then recorded also in historical records from the past. So there's some examples here of major epidemic or pandemic events that happened in human history that have been reconstructed based on early kind of medical uh, reports, if you want, like the plague of Athens, for example, um, which affected the leader Pericles at the time of Athens during one of the Peloponnese Wars. He, in fact, died of that disease. So that's why it probably also entered uh, the record. So it really changed history. It's not really clear what caused this large event that is described there. Um, but there's some speculation might have been measles, but there's uh, also quite a few others that have been mentioned. So far, we haven't found any pathogens from that time. There is uh, the Antonine Plague from the second century in the Roman Empire. It's also quite famous. Uh, Galen, uh, who described that from the descriptions, um, it looks like smallpox because a lot of pustules or like black spots all over the body. So um, again, we haven't found, unfortunately, yet what pathogen caused it. But it's millions of people that had died during that time. It should have, or at least based on some of those records, ended the expansion of the Roman Empire. So that's maybe speculation, but certainly had a large impact. Um, and it's uh, quite intriguing. And again, we haven't found the causative agent, but we are heavily looking for it. Then there's two examples that we now know have been caused by bubonic plague. One is the Justinianic plague um, in the end of the sixth century. Again, some people say that was actually contributing to the end of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was already gone at the time, uh, at least the Western Roman Empire in the sixth century. But indeed, at that time, um, Justinian, who was in fact the emperor of the East Roman Empire, expanded the empire again, um, and that caused then the kind of stop of that expansion. There's an estimate of about 50 million people that died in this kind of episodes that kind of started with one first wave called the Justinianic Plague, and then uh, several other outbreaks in the uh, uh, centuries after. There we know it is bubonic plague. It is a bit kind of debated if it was really this big event or if it was a smaller event because the medical or kind of like the literature we have from the time, of course, is very limited. Um, but it seems to have been at least uh, an event that was present in large parts of Western Eurasia because we have found the evidence of DNA from this Justinianic plague outbreak in Britain, in Spain, in Germany, in France. So it was uh, at least present in many different places at the time. And then, of course, the infamous Black Death, probably after the corona pandemic, the most famous pandemic uh, now. Um, so the uh, kind of event that happened in the 14th century that probably killed about half of all Europeans. Um, and that's something I will then talk more about in a few minutes. Um, we're then talking about what we call the... Ooh, that's interesting, okay. Um, the uh, second um, epidemiological transition, which is then, of course, the 19th century, where we have the introduction of hygiene, then in the 20th century, antibiotics and vaccination that really change our focus in medical research away from infectious diseases because 
we think they are under control, so there has been medical scientists and actually uh, even historians and other people in the 20th century that said by the end of the 20th century we will not have infectious diseases anymore in the human population, right? Which was crazy if you think about it now, but back in the day this was kind of the uh, Heilsbringer, you might say in German or something like that. So antibiotics were really seen as the kind of Wunderwaffe that will defeat all um, infectious diseases at least caused by bacteria. Of course, now we know, I mean, Henry Schulenburg and other people doing a lot of work on antibiotic resistance. It's still, of course, a, a big problem. And we know that this was probably a big uh, mistake so that we rather focused on diseases than in the end of the 20th century that are part of our lifestyle and not so much uh, caused by infectious diseases. Because now, in fact, we are what we call in the third epidemiological transition, because since the 1980s, a lot of pathogens are partially coming back because they're developing antibiotic resistance. Uh, so they're called re-emerging infectious diseases, like, for example, um, multidrug-resistant uh, tuberculosis. But they're, of course, also infectious diseases that have only entered the human population in the last 30 or 40 years. And, of course, we're all experts now in, in such a pathogen like the coronavirus in the last couple of years. But there are other examples from the 1980s. 80s and, and, and onward, like HIV, SARS, Hanta, Ebola, Lyme disease, and so forth. So pathogens that have just entered the human population were then uh, spreading and, of course, causing a major threat to human health, as we all just experienced. And now, when I was at the symposium 10 years ago, I proposed this plan then that um, to understand a bit better this process of early evolution, so how did those pathogens um, evolve to become a human pathogen, what is their evolutionary rate, so how fast do they change through time, and what's the interaction between the pathogen um, and the host, um, I proposed this idea of ancient pathogen genomics, like a new field of research where we go back in time and we study the genomes of pathogens from the past to learn something about the evolutionary process, how they change through time. Um, and how do we do that? We basically take skeletons from the past, uh, in most cases, we take teeth because a tooth is like a little time capsule where you have inside dried blood. So all blood-borne pathogens are basically then found in the dried blood. And you can then extract the DNA from those ancient pathogens, hopefully, that still has survived over thousands of years. I mean, you heard I was working many years with Svante Pebo, who is the pioneer in paleogenetics. And they have the oldest human genomes now from more than 300,000 years ago. The oldest mammoth genome is almost 2 million years old. So you can really go far back in time. And so I'm just looking at 1,000-year-old material, so it's much easier even. So you can then extract the DNA and then put that, of course, through this fantastic high throughput sequencing technologies that I think you or you have also done a lot of uh, early work on high throughput sequencing. At least I remember that from my visits in the past. And this is now, of course, standard technologies that allow really this deciphering of billions of DNA sequences also in our samples that come from thousands of years ago. So what this then provides to us is basically a molecular fossil record of pathogens. So we now have pathogen genomes. The oldest ones are more than 10,000 years old that we can then see how they change through time. And from your colleagues, you probably have a good overview of what you can do for just outbreaks, trying to understand also from our own experience in the coronavirus, kind of the different evolutionary steps that that virus took. We can now do that not just over like outbreaks of a couple of years, but actually over even 10,000s of years to understand better how they mutate, so what's their mutation rate? We even get calibration points to tell us how busy they were at a certain point in time, and then we can basically from that uh, induce what the mutation rate is. We can look at the interaction of host to pathogen, so how did it adapt to become a human pathogen, look at evolutionary changes that were part of that. And of course, we can also provide interesting information to, for example, archaeologists or historians that are interested to know what did my skeletons that I excavated die of? So what was the causative agent of that large uh, pandemics that I talked about? Or if I have a mass grave from 5,000 years ago, I want to know what these people died of. And we can actually look into that. So we have done a lot of work on Yersinia pestis, and I will talk about some of those studies uh, today. But we also looked at Mycobacterium leprae, so looking at the evolution of the causative agent of leprosy. The oldest ones we now have are, in fact, from ancient Egyptian mummies that are about 3,000 years old. Um, but some people I know are even working on older material now. 
We have done a lot of work on Treponema pallidum, which is the causative agent of syphilis, um, kind of tracing it back to the probably early evolution in the Americas. So it seems to be one of the few pathogens that were actually transported from the Americas to Europe. Um, so it first appears in 1494, um, related to a ship that came back with Columbus from the Caribbean, and they already then introduced syphilis to Europe. So um, that went quite fast. Um, and then it spread all over Europe, in fact, killing millions of people. Um, we have also done a lot of work on microbacterium tuberculosis evolution. Um, this was actually quite, quite a fun project because we looked at tuberculosis before Columbus in the Americas, and uh, the mo modern Native American populations all have European tuberculosis, so that was introduced after the Spaniards came there. So it was the question, was tuberculosis there before? And paleopathologists had looked at skeletons, they told us, yes, it was there, because you can actually see it in the bones. People had tuberculosis more than a thousand years ago, and we wanted to know what kind of tuberculosis, so we extracted the DNA from those ancient skeletons that were more than a thousand years old, from Peru, for example. And what we found surprisingly was not European tuberculosis, was not African tuberculosis, was not Asian tuberculosis, it was actually seal tuberculosis, so it was a zoonosis. It was actually a type of tuberculosis which is called Microbacterium pinipedii, that you today find in the southern hemispheres, like in Argentina or Chile, Australia, New Zealand, in seals. Um, and it's present all through the southern, uh, su southern hemisphere, and it probably was then taken up by a human population because there's a lot of seal hunting on the especially western coast of South America, and there probably it was then entered the human population. We could even then show over the last couple of years that it spread then in human populations, so in people that were not in contact with seals. So that was then again even giving rise to this type of tuberculosis in North America. And we've done a lot of work on uh, Salmonella enterica, so the causative agent of typhoid fever. Um, there we found that this was brought, one of those diseases from Europe, uh, by the Spaniards to the Americas and actually caused some large outbreaks in the 16th century, something that's called the Cocolitzli. So there was a large pandemic happening in Mexico in the uh, 1540s killing millions of people. As you might know, about 90% of the Native American population died within the first 100 years of contact, most of them probably due to infectious diseases. And we could actually really see how this spread during that time. And what we could also do over the last couple of years with a, uh, with a postdoc of mine, uh, Felix Kai, who is now at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, was to look at the evolution of this pathogen over 7,000 years to see from actually a wild pathogen was present in animal population and rarely picked up by hunter-gatherers to become a human adapted pathogen that by now is called paratype VC that is only found in humans, so not anymore in any animal population. And in between it was actually in domestic livestock, so it could really like, track the whole evolution from 7,000 years ago from the wild uh, to this pathogen that then became uh, human adapted. And then we also had the fantastic opportunity to work with this fellow, um, you might know who he is, he's the Ötzi, the Iceman, and uh, here we had this wonderful situation that he had a frozen stomach when he was discovered that was actually frozen from more than 5,000 years ago. And together with the group in Bolzano, we could actually, re uh, uh, then, and actually also Ben Kiyohakauso, who's here in Kiel, we could extract uh, DNA um, from, from the stomach and we could reconstruct entire genomes of Heliobacter pylori and look into the evolution of Heliobacter pylori over the last, last 5,000 years, uh, which was also very um, exciting because it was very different to what people had expected to be present um, 5,000 years ago. And together with Ben here, uh, I also then did some more research over the last couple of years in ancient virus genomes. So what I showed you before were all bacterial, ancient bacteria, but uh, we looked um, into the evolution of hepatitis B virus, um, which is still very prominent in the world today with millions of people that get infected um, every year. And uh, we were the first group then to look at um, ancient um, HPV, so from more than, in fact, 7,000 years ago, so from the early Neolithic, from the first people that brought farming here from Anatolia um, into Europe. Um, and we found this kind of virus genomes then, which at the time were pretty much somehow out of context because we didn't have a lot of data. We had 7,000 year old hepatitis B virus and the diversity we have in the world today. So it really didn't tell us too much about how it evolved through time. The closest cluster we even found was found in apes like in chimpanzees and gorillas, so we couldn't really make too much uh, out of it, but it was still a very exciting finding. It, it certainly received a lot of attention, so New York Times, Washington Post, like everywhere people talked about it, including in the Bildzeitung, who called, in fact, that old Neolithic case the oldest sex strolch. <laughs> 
which is a fantastic headline, especially if you have a picture of yourself down here, right? So um, <laughs> always enjoyable. Um, and in fact, of that research, we've done uh, follow-up work together with Artur and Denise over the last few years. We have now more than 100 genomes from all over Europe from the last more than 10,000 years of, like 11,000 is the oldest genome now from South America, in fact. So we have a much better understanding now of the evolution of the hepatitis B virus. So we get basically an overview through time where we have time slices here, where we have, if you go through time, 11,000 to about 1,000 years ago, you can see there are different colors, so different strains present at different time periods. So a bit like with corona through time, you have the replacement of one virus strain by another virus strain. And the farmers had a different one than hunter-gatherers had. And then there was a very interesting phenomenon here that about uh, between 3,000 and about 2,000 years ago, all those green diversity got replaced by the red and blue diversity. So there's a break here. You can actually see it. There's the, all those early farmer genomes that get replaced by those ones here. And um, so something happens about 3,000 years ago. We're not quite sure what happens, why all the genetic diversity gets replaced, but it's quite an interesting phenomenon. And um, what is, though, surprising, if we zoom into the early farmer diversity of the hepatitis, uh, hepatitis B virus here, is you see all this lost diversity, all strains that got lost in the past, but you can actually see one lineage survived and has a very interesting kind of pattern here. It survives, there's no kind of branch off for a very long time. And here it reemerges and actually massively reemerges quite recently. It actually reemerges in the 1980s and 90s. And where does it reemerge? It reemerges in HIV positive patients. Um, it's actually one st strain, it's called genotype G, which is found um, uh, in quite a few places in the world in people that have AIDS, especially in Africa. Um, and it's an interesting type of HPV. Because when, you, when how we know it today is it cannot, in people, usually affect healthy people or patients. It can only affect people that are immunocompromised. It lacks some of the uh, proteins that are actually necessary for, for um, uh, infecting. And then we were, of course, curious to see, okay, it evolved from something in the past. How are the close relatives in the past? We actually found out all the close relatives on that branch here are also lacking those proteins. They are also lacking the ability to then infect an individual. So then we're curious, how did it do it then? Those people have HIV, those people probably didn't have HIV. But when we looked closer, we actually found that all those people were co-infected with another HPV strain. So all the ones where we found that strain here in the past, those close relatives are all co-infections. So they had one strain and they had another strain. So this strain only entered in co-infected states. Um, and then today, again, immunocompromised people can be found. But what's most striking, and we still don't have a good answer, is all those strains that are just normal strains that don't need a co-infection or anything like that, they got extinct. And this is the only one that survived, the one that cannot infect by itself. So it's really almost a mystery. But part of that, why it cannot infect, is also that um, the proteins that are needed for infection are actually the ones that cause the immune system to actually act on the HPV. So the way kind of basically to escape the immune system for a long time might have just been to not have those proteins, but how it then survived for six or 7,000 years, we still don't know. So it's quite a mystery, and hopefully it was actually re-emerging here in Southeast Asia, so maybe if we have more data from Southeast Asia, we actually see the different kind of stages in between those 7,000 years. So it's really quite a remarkable finding that I just wanted to mention. But I wanted to talk about plague, and I already are <laughs> 20 minutes in or so, so sorry for that. But I really want to come back to Yersinia pestis now because I find it also a fascinating case of kind of looking into the evolution of a pathogen over longer time periods. So first, a few words about plague itself. Plague is actually not a good example of a human-adapted disease because it is just not adapted to humans. It's adapted to rodents. You find it in wild rodent populations all over the world, and the way how it gets transmitted is actually a very nifty mechanism that the, 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 the vector that transmits the disease is actually a flea. How does he do that? The flea takes with a blood meal bacteria up into its stomach and then here in the proventricular, in the kind of prostomach if you want, those bacteria start to build a biofilm that actually causes a blockage of the gut. So next time the flea is biting, it cannot swallow blood it has to spit it out again, and in that moment, it has to come. It has to basically become in contact with the biofilm. So bacteria are in the spit, and by that, it basically transmits the bacteria into the next bite wound. And if that is with another individual, then of course the other individual gets infected. And what's even more intriguing is that when the the, the, the stomach is blocked uh, of a flea, 
it changes its behavior because it's starving. So it keeps on biting again and again. It bites up to 200 times people have measured it a day. So it really bites and bites and bites and bites. It cannot swallow blood. And then, of course, it transmits the bacteria all the time it does bite. Um, eventually, the rodent might, in fact, die. The flea might look for the next host, which could be another rodent, but it could also be a commensal that lives with humans, such as cats or dogs, but it can especially also rodents that live as commensal with humans, such as rats and mice. And they are probably what really caused those large-scale epidemics in the past, because there were a lot of rats and a lot of mice in the past close to human populations. And then when the rat, for example, the mouse died and the flea looked for the next warm body, it might have not been another rat, but it might in fact be a human. So the fleas can then jump to humans, cause also an infection, bacteria enter the lymph system, usually go to the lymph nodes, lymph nodes become big and swollen, and that's what's called the bubo. So this is why we call it bubonic plague, because the lymph node just becomes big. Through the lymph system, then the bacteria basically spread all over the body, usually cause sepsis, and infected people in the first uh, seven to 10 days, which causes death then usually within one to two weeks in about 50% of all people that get infected. So mortality is really high, about 50%. Um, and then people might survive, so they might have partial immunity afterwards. That's what causes the waves, because of course it's not inherited to the next generation, so children and then kind of younger generation might get it again. Um, but again, a lot of people, in fact, then die of it. Uh, as I said before, in medieval time, it's estimated that about half of the population dies. Mortality is about half of the people that get it, so we can actually imagine that everyone had it at the time, right? So everyone, in fact, got infected, so which also tells you how many fleas were around um, during those time periods. But bubonic plague is not the only form of plague. There's another form of plague, which is called pneumonic plague, where people get, in fact, infected by droplets, for example, that they inhale. So then also people can infect other people. So if you have bubonic plague, your lungs are infected, you're coughing, somebody else inhales little droplets with bacteria. They get directly infected in the lung. And then that cause pneumonic plague has an even higher mortality, about 90% mortality, and usually can also not be treated with antibiotics. This is one of the reasons why Yersinia pestis has been studied quite intensively in the past by defense ministries. So a lot of the labs, lots of microbiology labs that study Yersinia pestis in the world are somehow linked to, to defense because of bioterrorism. Because if you spray that pathogen into, a, say, a tube somewhere, or a subway or something like that, um, people could get infected and, and treatment might even be too late. So it's, it's, it's a serious, uh, I think, threat. It's found again today everywhere in the world. Um, most of the diversity of the pathogen as well as uh, the, the hosts is actually found in Central Asia where we think it probably evolved. Um, but you can actually find it in all continents today. Um, there has been recent outbreaks that some of you might have followed in Madagascar in 2017, for example, but it's also found, for example, in the United States. So if you go to the Grand Canyon, the actually warning signs you shouldn't pet the squirrels because they can in fact infect you with um, Yersinia pestis. Um, so it's really found um, all over the world. But the strain that is found everywhere outside uh, this, this region here is the same strain. Um, it's actually branch one that probably disseminated in the, in the 19th century and basically then um, established it all over the world. I already mentioned some of the um, historical events uh, that uh, we now know have been caused by Yersinia pestis. So the first, so-called first pandemic that started in the mid uh, sixth century, which lasted about 250 years, then magically it disappears. We don't know why it disappears, but it does magically disappear, like Donald Trump wanted corona to disappear. So something happens here. Um, we're not quite sure what. What we've seen recently was that when we looked at rat genomics, also together here with, with Ben, um, we looked at the diversity of rats, and we could actually see that around that time you have a genetic turnover in rats. So uh, the, 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 the black rat population in Central Europe gets replaced by another black rat population, which could mean that there was some sort of bottleneck. So maybe something happens in rats and that's why they disappear, but that's just one hypothesis. We are not quite sure. It does, though, come back with a black death then in the mid 14th, uh, 14th century here. Again, it lasts for several hundred years. We have about 7,000 outbreaks of plague um, until the 18th century, and then again, magically, it disappears. Here we have some better ideas. Probably, again, it's related to rats, because what actually happens in the beginning of the 18th century is that the rat that you might know, if you've ever seen a rat on the street somewhere, it was probably not the rat that caused the uh, bubonic plague or transmitted it at the time. It was probably a brown rat, a uh, ratus norvegicus called Wanderratte in German. And that actually, <laughs> Einwandern, so it actually comes to Europe 
um, at that time, so in the in the beginning of the 18th century, and replaces the black red, which was the red that transmitted the the the, the plague. Um, it's quite aggressive, the brown red towards the black red. So wherever there are black reds and brown reds come in, black reds disappear. In fact, the black red in Germany is on the red list. Yeah. So that red that actually caused the plague back in the day is actually now endangered. So um, uh, maybe because of the brown red, so that sometimes say when people find reds disgusting, they, they might have saved us from the plague, right? So uh, at least that's one hypothesis. And then in the 19th century, there's another emergence of plague, this time not in Europe, but in East Asia. I just mentioned it's found all over the world. This is because of the third pandemic starts in Hong Kong, um, and then through steamships and ship rats, which is also black rats, it gets them transmitted all over the world, and that's where we find it everywhere. This is also the time when um, actually Pasteur sends this nice gentleman here um, to uh, Hong Kong to do research on this kind of enigmatic outbreak there. Alexander Yersin, he finds out that there is this kind of transmission of this bacteria um, and that fleas and, and uh, rodents are probably involved. It gets then also named after him and this is then since when we know the bacterium itself. And the first work that we did then some years ago that I in fact presented 19 years ago already, was working on the Black Death. Because at the time, we were not sure what has caused the Black Death. It was debated. Some people said it was a virus. Some people said it was a bacterium. Some people said it was an unknown disease. So there was much, much speculation. So we went out and uh, started to work on a collection from the so-called East Smithfield, which is a cemetery in London, where all the people from that cemetery died during the Black Death. Because it was open during the Black Death, because they had so many dead people and then they closed it again afterwards. It's next to the tower. So if you ever are in the tower, it's really just like one street away from the, from the Tower of London. So we can be pretty sure if we have skeletons from the site that they died in the Black Death, that we then wanted to see if your senior pastors is present. But it's, of course, if you think about it, maybe straightforward to just do a PCR and see if it's there, like we've done corona tests over the last three years almost every day. Um, but that was actually something we did, and indeed we found a senior pastor. So at that point, we could have said, okay, yeah, it was present, so probably uh, the uh, uh, senior pastor is called the Black Death. But we wanted to go one step further and wanted to see if we can actually look at the evolution of this pathogen. If we, can, we constructed this entire genome and learned something about how this is different to your senior pastors we have in the world today. But this is quite challenging because if you extract DNA from an ancient tooth, like I showed you earlier on that cartoon version, it's really just a tiny amount of DNA that is in fact of the pathogen from that tooth. The majority is, many of you do my um, environmental genomics, it's just from the environment. It's like a soil sample. It's like I go here in the garden, I dig a hole, extract DNA. It's about the same composition as what you might get from such a skeleton from the past. So there's only about 1% of the DNA usually that is human DNA, and only a fraction of that is the pathogen that has killed the person. So if you just extract DNA, even with powerful sequencing machines, you would have to spend a lot of resources to just get enough DNA to re kind of uh, puzzle back together a genome from the past. So we had to come up with a different approach, and what we used was DNA capture. There are many different techniques how we do that. In this case, we did an array capture, so we have a little glass slide with DNA on the surface. So DNA that is similar will bind to that DNA. Everything that is not similar can be washed away. So by that, you basically then enrich for the DNA that you're interested in. You then stick it in one of those sequencing machines, and then hopefully you have enough DNA to then puzzle back together the genome. And this is actually the amount of your senior pastor's DNA we had before enrichment. This is the amount of your senior DNA after enrichment. So you can see it's quite a powerful technique that allows us to then get enough DNA sequences to reconstruct the genome. And this is then what we did 10 years ago. We then reconstructed the chromosome and the three plasmids of your senior pastor, about 99% of the genome was 30-fold coverage, meaning we have seen every position about 30 times. Uh, and then we could do some, if you want, family history of Yersinia pestis. We could then see how is the genome from the Black Death related to Yersinia pestis you find in the world today. And this is the family tree of Yersinia pestis. So those are the major four branches that are found in the world today with about 80% of all the strains. And then there's some earlier strains that branch off early on time. And they all come from this a uh, common ancestor called Yersinia tuberculosis, or it has a common ancestor with Yersinia tuberculosis. In fact, it actually falls into the diversity of Yersinia tuberculosis. So then the first question was, how is the Black Death related to modern strains? What we found, maybe not a big surprise, and back then it was, it does fall here. It falls very much close to the base of the diversification of the main four strains that are found in the world today. This is, in fact, the one you find all over the world that probably caused the third pandemic. So it falls very close here, and in fact, it is the most recent common ancestor of the, of the strains that are found here. 
meaning that it doesn't have a derived position. It doesn't have a position in its genome that only is found in the Black Death, but is not found in the daughter lineages. So all the daughter lineages from this branch won't go back to the Black Death. So it really kind of basically was the mother of this strain here, which is interesting because it means that <laughs> it's basically still around, right? Because you have then everything, all this diversity that comes out of that node here, that is found in the Grand Canyon or Madagascar, or Central Asia and China and Oceania, it all goes back to this common ancestor here. And it doesn't have anything special. So based on its biology, you can't really say it has a special gene, it's kind of maybe more higher mortality or something like that. Because that would have then meant convergent evolution that this gene got lost in all lineages if it's not found today anymore. Um, from that point, we wanted to go further. And what we then did over the oh Jesus, uh, last couple of years, uh, we will come in a minute, is that we looked, you can see all over Europe, into many different outbreaks, mass graves, all kind of individuals that we could then get Yersinia pestis from to reconstruct what happened after the Black Death. And this was work that was largely done by Maria Spirou, who did a PhD and a postdoc with me back in the day. So she looked at Yersinia passes then through time, so do a little bit of time travel. Starting with the Black Death, she had then one genome that came from a site in Eastern Europe um, that was very close to the site where it was first recorded in the past. This is a site called Leishevo. And surprisingly, what she found was that it was basal to the Black Death. It was one mutation away from the causation here of the Black Death. So it was just, just down, basically, here in, in, in its evolutionary history. And this is interesting because... It, I just said, it was first recorded in the East, in Eastern Europe, and it has moved from the East into the West. And this is supported by this strain here because it is really one mutation less than, than kind of this, this Black Death uh, um, event here. She also then had a number of individuals from the Black Death, so from the actual outbreak, which was all over Europe, again, killing millions of people. And where do they fall in the phylogeny? You might see it or not see it. You see this kind of red dot popping up here. So the ones from Spain, the ones from France, the ones from England, the ones from Germany, we now have about 30 of them. They are 100% identical, all of them, in their complete genome, 4.2 million positions. Not a single mutation during the Black Death. Five-year pandemic, killing 50 million people, no microevolution whatsoever, right? Which is amazing if you think about it. Like during Corona, we have all this microevolution, all those strains, alpha, beta, gamma, you name it. Not during the Black Death. It was introduced, one strain introduced, radiated, killed millions of people, didn't evolve. <laughs> when we calculate the mutation rate of Yersinia pestis over a long time, we get one mutation per 10 years. This is a five-year period. Makes sense. There shouldn't be a mutation. But that was also then what we saw. So it is actually quite interesting. We then have later outbreaks, which are in the late 14th century. And they have then some mutations, like three here, one there. So it's not a lot, but some mutations towards this strains. And in fact, we, we now have many on this kind of branch here that fall a bit like pearls on a chain towards this branch one. So we see a lot of microevolution. Now, this is in Europe, this is in Europe, this is in Europe. There are more here. They're all in Europe giving rise to this thing which causes the third pandemic in the 19th century. It seems that the microevolution leading to this branch, in fact, happened in Europe. So that not just the second pandemic, but also the third pandemic actually started here, but many years before it actually then spread in the 19th century. We also have a large branch that comes out of the Black Death, which is all the recorded then uh, outbreaks, the thousands of ones that happened then uh, after the Black Death, where we have genomes from so far, they're all coming out of the Black Death. So really the Black Death was this kind of radiation event in Europe. We have a lot of diversity getting born, but completely lost. None of them survived because it's, it's gone. It's not there in Europe anymore, right? It disappeared in the 18th century. And then the late stages of its evolution, it's also quite interesting because um, in those late genomes here, we have some loss of virulence genes. So it seems to lose virulence through time, which is something that people have proposed for pathogens for a long time. So if a pathogen gets introduced, sometimes it kind of burns out. It loses virulence because it might, it's actually not good if it kills. It might be better if it doesn't kill as fast to get kind of uh, disseminated better. And we do see this kind of uh, evolution here towards the loss of virulence. Which is interesting because the same thing happens in the same region in the genome 800 years earlier during the Justinianic plague. The same regions get lost, completely independent on a different lineage, right? So this really convergent evolution during the end of the pandemic, so maybe even then somehow being related, but that's uh, pretty much speculation here. 
So for the Black Death, we have the dispersal model now, pretty good understanding, 14th century, like historical records um, suggest, it, it seems to enter then Central Europe, remains here for hundreds of years, it doesn't get reintroduced. There were a lot of people, researchers in our field, that said, get reintroduced, it comes from Central Asia again and again, and it comes in their waves after waves from Central Asia, but no, it's here. It's actually here for 400 years, it doesn't leave. It does leave, though, in this one strain that later on causes the large pandemic, but it doesn't enter again. So it really seems to be basically present throughout the entire uh, time period. One other big question then for us was, can we trace back its origin? Can we actually say where did it come from? It is first recorded here in Kaffa, in Crimea, but where did it kind of come from? The oldest genomes that we have from here, but people have suggested it came from the Caucasus, some people from Central Asia, some people from East Asia, some people uh, from, uh, from Northeastern Asia and so forth. There were many hypotheses where it was. And we have been very, very lucky to work with this person here, a historian called Phil Slavin, because he looked at a very kind of special site uh, for plague researchers that is called Karadijak, which is close to Bishkek, the capital of Kyrgyzstan. And this is a unique site because this is a site from the 14th century where we have gravestones in some old Syriac language that say this person, with the name of that person, died in 1338 on pestilence, right? Which is fantastic because it kind of gives us the date when the person died, the name we don't care too much about, but that the person died of pestilence. So it's a lead to look into those skeletons, what they might have, maybe the pathogen that might have uh, been present in them. So we collected skeletons, and what's also interesting about them is if you actually look at the tombstones, you see that there's a big event here. 120 out of the 460 tombstones are all from the year 1338, really indicating there was some sort of outbreak during that time, right? So again, Maria worked on this material. She extracted genomes in seven of them. She could actually see um, evidence. Three were enough to get whole genomes. How do they look like? We could reconstruct them. Where do they fall in the phylogeny? Look at that tree. You might already kind of expect where they fall, they fall exactly here. They're actually the most recent common ancestor of all the four major branches that are found in the world today. So this is literally now the most recent common ancestor of those four branches that we now know is from 1338. Black Death starts in 1346. So this is basically the mother of the Black Death, if you want, right? So of that strain that then radiates in, in, in Western uh, Europe um, later. So that was very exciting. What's also interesting is um, that we have uh, in the a marbled population in the same region here. So this is where the site was. We have uh, strains that are found in those marmots here. And in fact, the blue strain here is the closest related one to this uh, diversification event here, also to the star, to the, this one. So still today in the vicinity, you have the closest living relative of that strain, uh, which is really remarkable. So meaning that it was basically around there for 700 years. And then somewhere there, then jumped into the human population or into commensals with, that were living in close proximity with humans and then spread to Europe, so eight years later, again, causing the Black Death. Um, another question that we had now for the last seven or eight years was, this is the historical pandemics. What happened before? Was plague already around? You have seen that tree, you have that big diversification event, but what happened in, in, in the past of that? So we did a lot of metagenomics, we did a lot of screening for pathogens over time. We and also other colleagues, also Ben here, for example, also the Copenhagen group, they did a lot of work on that. And we actually found that plague <coughs> was pretty common already in prehistory. The oldest plague genomes now we have are more than 5,000 years old, and you can actually see them from all over Eurasia. So this is something that we now call the late Neolithic Bronze Age plague, because that's the time period when it was spreading during that time. And what's really interesting about that type of plague that we have from this time is that if you look at the genome, there's actually a whole chunk missing. It actually lacks some of the key genes that are necessary for the flea transmission. This pathogen could not have been transmitted by fleas, right? So not being able to cause therefore bubonic plague. So the question then is how was it transmitted between people? One idea is pneumonic plague, possibly. It was certainly found in the blood, because otherwise we wouldn't find it in those skeletons in really high amounts, so it caused some sort of sepsis. How did it enter? We are not sure. Some people also think it's gastrointestinal, it's possible. We see that in Salmonella enterica. We don't really know. Um, but uh, it was a different pathogen. To really understand how it worked, we would have to reconstruct it, <laughs> which we're not planning to do. Um, 
especially not after the last three years. <laughs> I think this would be a very bad idea. Um, but otherwise, I think it will be very hard for us to really understand uh, how this, how this uh, transmission mechanism worked in the past. So um, there's a lot of open question about it because it's extinct today. This lineage is not found anywhere in the world today. So it's in the phylogeny, it's basically a lineage that branches off five and a half thousand years ago. There's also some earlier lineages here that Ben and his group here described, um, and that kind of are basically gold de sacs so they're all uh, extinct. This one is the one that we find over 3,000 years, first entering the human population about 5,000 years ago. It's a very enigmatic pathogen because it evolves in a very strange way, and I have a lot of expertise on evolutionary scientists in the room, it evolves like a virus. So what happens here is, and this is just an older kind of um, analysis here from 2018, we now have about 40 genomes from this pathogen, and they evolve like pearls on a chain. So you have one pathogen that gets repla replaced by another one, it gets replaced by another one, it gets replaced by another one, it gets replaced like another one, and that goes on for 3,000 years. You never have two parallel lineages. There's always one strain that gets replaced by another strain, gets replaced by another strain, that are all connected through a backbone. But the backbone, basically, is one, because it's not two branches, it's one branch over 3,000 years. It's really remarkable. It's a bit like, like the flu evolves in some ways, where you have a new strain that evolves somewhere that replaces the previous strain, or like corona evolved. You had the alpha that replaced by the beta or gamma or omicron and so forth. It behaves like that, but in a very, very systematic way. We have genomes almost every 100 years now, and it's a bacterium. It does, it's not a virus, so it's really hard to come up with this being all positive selection through higher virulence or something like that. So the best explanation we currently have is it has a tiny population size, which is, is somewhere in Eurasia, there's somewhere a place where it resides for 3,000 years, and every couple of decades or so it emerges, spreads all over Eurasia, because we have strains like from Estonia that have the closest relative in the Altai. So it is highly mobile. It moves all over Eurasia in short time, but that then it completely collapses and then it reemerges again. And that over 3,000 years. It's really enigmatic. If anyone has an idea, look for me during dinner, right? Because it's, it's really something we haven't really understood. Uh, what we do have, though, are now a whole bunch of genomes from about 4,000 to 3,000 years ago that in the phylogeny fall here. They actually fall basal to the modern day. Uh, variation, but actually in the middle of it, because some uh, earlier uh, strains of Yersinia pestis are still around the world today, branch off before that. So there is Yersinia pestis about 3,800 years ago, like we know it. If you look at the genome, it's the green ones here, they have all the genes necessary for flea transmission. So they are already bubonic plague as we know it, which is about 4,000 years old. So it evolves sometime between 5,000 and 4,000 years ago. Because in fact, all the genes that are necessary for the flea transmission, they all evolve in this short time period. So by 4,000 years ago, we have Yersinia pestis as we know it. 5,000 years ago, we don't. So it's a relatively short time period for a relatively complex mechanism to evolve and then not change much at all. So it's not that we see major genomic changes in the last 4,000 years. What we do see is a massive increase in effective population size during that time. So basically it evolves and then it becomes super successful, probably because of rodent species that get infected. And then of course there are huge populations. So it makes a lot of sense that it spreads then during that time. Now I want to summarize. So what did I talk about? The causative agent of Yersinia pestis has at least caused three historical pandemics that people kind of assume to be caused by Yersinia pestis. This is something that is pretty much established now. I didn't talk about the, the, um, the Justinianic plague that much, but we have a lot of genomes now from that time period, and they all indicate that this was also a plague. Um, the Black Death genome itself has only very small differences to the modern strains. Overall, if you look at the Black Death genome, you compare that to one of the modern strains, the daughters that came out of it, there's about 90 mutations, right? It's not a lot over the whole genome. So it's really tiny differences, pretty much the same since the last 600, 700 years. Um, the Black Death originated, as we seem to see it, in the foothills of the Tian Shan, probably sometime in the 1330s. Again, some people had suggested it kind of evolved in the 11th century, 12th century, and all kind of different hypotheses, but now we have really good evidence. We have a grave with a date, with a name, with a genome. So I think can't be much more certain than that. Um, the fleet transmission evolved less than 5,000 years ago in this time window between 5,000 and 4,000 years ago. There were epidemic outbreaks in, in, in prehistory, which is an interesting insight in itself because 
there is a lot of things that happened. The Iron Age, Late Bronze Age, uh, collapse of the Eastern Mediterranean. There's a lot of big things that happen that people, you know, even in the Bible, people talk about the Egyptian plague, people talk about the Hitt Hittite plague, the Athenian plague, and so forth. So they might, you know, be good candidates now to look for your senior pastors as well. Um, and of course, uh, we have this uh, bubonic plague then itself being about 4,000 years old. So Middle Bronze Age, an interesting period, as I just mentioned. In the Middle Bronze Age, towards the Late Bronze Age, you have an almost complete collapse of basic civilization in the Mediterranean. The whole Eastern Mediterranean collapses. You have the Hittites collapse, the Mycenaeans collapse, uh, Canaanites uh, collapse, the uh, Egyptian Empire is under major pressure um, and, and gets then later on conquered. So something big happens during this time. Some people suggested diseases, maybe it's that. Uh, could be something else, but at least it's a, it's a good lead in that direction. So by that, I want to thank a lot of people that uh, participated in the research here, um, especially Kirsten Alexander's group leaders, a lot of PhD students working on plague with us uh, in uh, Jena and Leipzig and Tübingen, in fact, already the rest of my uh, department. Uh, thank you for your attention. Maybe have quite... Time for the question. I'm realizing I'm between you and dinner, so we can also keep it short. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention.